Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Wire Industry Automation Chemical Bath. My name is Dane Armanderas and I will be your moderator for today's program. This program is being recorded and will be added to the WAI archives and will be available to you within a few weeks. So if you miss any part of it, you will be able to go back through it at a future date. Housekeeping. We have a few housekeeping uh, items to go over before we start the webinar on how you use GoToWebinar interface. To the left is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you can see the presentation. You can maximize the screen by clicking in the upper right hand corner or shrink it in the same place. To the right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can raise your hand, ask a question, and select audio for your mode. The upper right panel allows you to control your audio type, and below that is how you ask questions. You must type your questions. You can hear us, but we cannot hear you. When questions are submitted, they'll be read by the moderator, myself, anonymously. We will take and answer those questions at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to ask them in any time you'd like. Wire Expo Operation Summits and Wire Expo 2020, which was originally planned for June 3rd and 4th at the Mohican Sun Resort Casino, has been postponed at this time. Leadership made the difficult but necessary decision not to hold the event in June due to the uncertainty about the trajectory of the COVID-19 virus. These safety measures were taken in step with guidelines announced recently by government officials as the health and safety of WAI's community remains the priority. The Wire Association is investigating the availability of new event dates and or modifications to the event format and will keep its constituents informed of the progress as new information becomes available. The Wire Association is still open and the WAI staff works remotely at home. Please contact them at info at wirenet.org if you need to discuss anything with them. We have a poll that we would like to ask you to answer. Since other people might be watching this presentation with you, we would like to know how many people are in the room with you, and it better not be 10 or more. This will give us a true sense of how many people are participating live and the interest in these type of topics. Uh, while we're doing the poll right now, I have a little commercial. If you have topics for our webinar in the future you would like to see, please let us know it. And if you and your company would like to present a webinar, please also contact us. We're looking for new ideas, new content, and new topics to bring to the market. Okay, now we'll close the poll and thank you for responding. Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Bob Bodak, whom I have known for nearly 25 years. Bob graduated from Trenton State College and received his MBA from Georgian Court University. He is the Director of Process Equipment and Engineering at BASF Shemital. Today's webinar will focus as promoted on making BASF more efficient, automated sampling, testing, and addition, data collection, operator safety. And with that, I'll turn this presentation over to Bob. At times, we do have technical difficulties because we're all working remotely. All right. Uh, thank you, Dane. I appreciate it very much. Dane, are you able to see the presentation well? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. So we see the presentation screen, not the side screen. Uh, we see the Wonderful. little side screen with it also. Oh, you do? Okay. So I need to need to change this. I'm sorry. Did that work, or is that still the same way? Uh, you have the main, the large slide and then the side slide beside it. All right. Um, I'm sorry. I was trying to get that to 
to come at the opposite way, but it's showing uh, a different screen. Let me just try one other thing here. And that's good. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right, welcome all, and I, I apologize for the little inconvenience. I um, want to thank you all for taking the time today uh, to be part of this uh, presentation topic. Uh, what I tried to do is to uh, provide a little bit of insight into several different topics to hopefully stimulate a little bit of um, conversation, and at the same time to give you a little bit of information about what could be done for automation in the wire industry. So some of the topics that we're going to be talking about today, um, a little example of a process line. Uh, we'll go into some way some agitation is used to enhance the chemical process. And we'll be talking about some different types of filtration um, to extend your bath lights. Uh, we'll go into a little bit of history of powder feeding to see if, in fact, that can help out your process. Uh, talk a little bit about process control and then also go into the data collection systems. Everything we'll be talking today is going to be based on uh, a process line example that I have here. Um, this example um, is typical to what a process may be. Uh, all tanks may not be exactly the same. Um, the tanks may be a little bit differently based on the way your building layout is. Uh, but again, everything we're going to be going over today uh, will be based on this where we have the, the cleaning, um, the rinsing, the pickling, uh, a spray rinse, the cascade rinse, uh, and then the uh, also the phosphatizing, the activation, and uh, digitization line, and so on. So this may not look exactly like your setup, um, but this is considered to be an optimal setup for the application. So first thing we're going to talk a little bit about is that that is agitation. There's many ways to agitate a tank, and I'm sure you've probably tried a lot of them. Um, agitation does help enhance the chemical process. There's people that have put mixers, propeller-style mixers, into the tanks. There's people who have used air, people who have used eductor-type nozzles. Um, one setup had a huge paddle that went around in a circle um, and moved the stuff from one end of the tank to another. So there's a lot of different styles out there. And so today what I'm going to do is kind of focus just on the ones used for air and also for eductor agitation. Um, air is used all over the world um, due to its, you know, its installation is very, very simple. There's an abundant supply of it all over. And the installation, again, being so simple, it only requires in many cases a one inch or larger pipe across the bottom of the tank. Uh, people will do this nothing more than drill some holes into the tank. And um, basically the pipe goes the entire length from one end to another, maybe even on both sides. And what it'll do is just bubble the air up into the tank and the air bubbling up will allow a natural agitation to take place, similar to what you would see um, in some types of, if your, your jacuzzis that you would see, if in fact the um, pressurized system goes down so the pump is no longer pumping, you may still have some air effervescent through. This type of agitation is what you would see uh, with just a basic air agitation. Um, the next method is, is the adductor agitation. This is becoming more and more common in the industry. What it requires is a couple pipes strategically placed with eductors on them, and the eductors give a good motion, very, very similar to what you would see in a jacuzzi type setup, where it will violently mix the tank and agitate the tank in such a way to really enhance the chemical and the rinsing processes. We're not looking to get impingement on the part with these nozzles. What we're looking to do is to allow this solution to move around and through the coil so that all the wire, everything is completely cleaned and treated accordingly because you have this motion going around and it's no longer a stagnant tank by itself. Um, if you take a look at the adductor nozzle, you'll see that the input, each one gallon of pressurized fluid that goes through that will mix with four gallons of liquid through the adductor portion and your output would be five gallons of recirculation. So if we're looking at the different tanks that you would have, a cleaner tank may require 20 to 30 tank turns an hour. Well, if we have a 3,000 gallon cleaner tank, 
with 25 tank turns, so we'll pick it right in the middle. We're talking about 11 eductors strategically placed inside that tank. Um, the pump that we would need would be capable of doing approximately 260 gallons a minute at 40 PSI. The formula for doing this, if anybody's interested, is that you just take the gallons in your tank um, and then multiply it by how many tank turns you want. And you take the gallons by the tank turns and then divide it by 60 because, again, we're talking tank turns per hour. And what we want to do is reduce that down to gallons per minute. And then we do it again. We reduce it by divide it by five. So let's take the 3,000-gallon tank, 25 tank turns, divided by 60, divided by five, and we get approximately 250, 260 gallons per minute of a pump that we would need. So looking at the different setups, um, for a cleaning tank, the pump may be required for 250, 260 gallons a minute. Um, your rinse tanks would be less. You could go buy with a smaller tank and less seductor nozzles, because typically 10 to 20 tank turns is enough. And then you go down to your zinc phosphate tank, and you'll see a zinc phosphate tank may only require a pump that's going to do approximately 75 to 100 gallons a minute in order to keep everything completely agitated. So looking at this type of setup, and it's a very, very convenient setup to do, the most important thing is to make sure that your reductors are strategically placed in such a way so that you hit all the spots and you get a good agitation. There's no dead spots in the tank. When you're comparing the two, air agitation to the adductor style, what you'll see that the air being very easy to install, but it's also very expensive to operate. And this is something that a lot of people uh, forget about in that you're, you're talking about a air that you say, well, every plant has it. It's around all over the place. Well, yes, it is, but you need a compressor to compress that air and then you need to be able to take it from the compressor and bring it over to your process. Where an eductor agitation might be a little bit more expensive to install, but it's definitely less expensive to operate, and it gives you a much more uniform agitation. We put a tank system in for one customer in Ohio, and they were presently using a 25 horsepower compressor, and it was calculated out that that compressor cost them over $26,000 a year in order to run in electric costs. The eductor agitation system that we put in required only a 10 horsepower motor and the annual electric savings uh, cost of that was $10,456. So you see there was a $12,000 savings almost of using eductor agitation as compared to air. And also it was a lot more uniform the system paid for itself literally in less than six months. So if well, I'm I looking at a question. Sure. On the inductor agitation, is it possible to use that also as a area where you can add a liquid chemical to the bath if you want it? Sure, and some people will do that. Um, the only thing you have to be careful about is to make sure that what you the piping and everything you're using for the adductors itself are chemically compatible. Um, these adductors are made in a lot of different materials. Um, they'll make them out of PVC or polypro. They're made out of cast iron. They're made out of stainless steel. And you could also get them out of kynar and some of the exotic alloys. And if you're going to be adding the chemical directly into that in a concentrated form, um, it's probably best just to make sure that it is chemically compatible. But yes, it will work and it'll work very well. One of the other problems, though, that's associated with air agitation that I didn't touch on, besides being expensive, air sometimes will have oil inside of it, you know, have moisture inside of it, and the piping that's bringing the air in many of the older plants is usually black iron or carbon steel. And because of that, you have a lot of rust that's internal to that piping. And now we're bringing those contaminants into the tank that we're using um, to agitate with our air. So you, you want to be cautious of that. You may want to filter the air that you're using prior to it going into the tank in order to get those types of contaminants out because uh, it could present the problem for you later on. Um, but again, air, 
is the most commonly used all over the world, um, but at the same time, it's a very, very expensive way um, to run your process as compared to going with um, conventional eductor style agitation. Next on the agenda was filtration. And I wanted to touch on a couple things for filtration for you, just to give you an idea on, um, on what can be done for our process tanks in the wire industry. There's many types of filtration. I'm sure you've tried a lot of them. There's your conventional bag filtration. There's your cartridges. There's fabric media. Um, there's the pressurized bed filtration, and there's also the filter presses. So these types of items that are out there all have their fit in a given application, uh, but sometimes they're used in applications that may not be the best for them to be used in. Um, the, the cleaner baths, as an example, you know, typically you would try to turn them over three to five turns an hour for filtration. And most of the time you're gonna use a filter bag that, or filter media that's somewhere between 25 and 40 micron in size. Um, your zinc phosphate, you know, may only require a turnover of five times a day, uh, but the loading in a zinc phosphate is going to be considerably more than the loading that you would see in a cleaner bath. Um, zinc phosphates also somewhere in the 25 micron is a good starting rate. Your acid pickles, they're in two to three times an hour again that you would want to work with. And the same thing for your neutralizing rinses, the same thing in that, uh, that time frame. So we're talking just a couple times in, uh, an hour that you want to turn the bath off. And again, 25 micron is a great starting place uh, when you're talking about what micron fabric should I use for them. Um, some of the different styles that I'm sure you're familiar with, your conventional bag filtration. All right, this is probably the most common that's used in the industry. Um, one of the problems with the conventional bags, though, is that the bags plug up. And when the bags plug, a lot of times the maintenance people will take out that 25 micron and put a 50 or put a 100 micron bag in. Reason being is, is that now instead of changing it once a day they, or once a shift, they could change it once a week, not realizing that you're not helping the bath by basically putting more and more of that particulate matter into it. So ideally what you'd want to do is not necessarily worry about the, you know, changing the bag out to a different size. It's, I would make sure that if you needed to change it out less frequently, look at going with a larger vessel. Instead of a single or a dual bag, go with a multiple bag vessel. Something that in the conventional method, you can get these in eight, 10, 12, and so on bags. And then what that'll do is, is allow you to change it out a lot less often. The next media that you see in the center of the page is the indexing bed or gravity style filter. All right? This provides very, very good filtering, but it's much slower than what you would see out of the conventional bag. What typically the setup for this system would be is that you'll have a pump that's going to pump the solution on top of that chain, which would have a fabric media on it. And what will happen is, is that chain then will index as the fabric media blinds because of the contamination. It'll allow the chain to move faster across and move it up maybe three to six inches at a time until that particular area gets plugged. And the chain will always overflow the media into, you see the container that's sitting on top. Uh, the media would start over on a roll on this portion, and it'll flow into across, down across the chain, and then dump out into here. Um, biggest problem with this type of filter, again, it is very efficient, but it is also a heat sink. Um, you'll lose a lot of temperature in this particular type of filter system because you're going to be pumping the solution, the heated solution, up into the filter. It's going to be sitting in that filter as is gravity feeding through, and it's going to be going through to the bottom and then gravity feeding back into your process tank. Well, because of that, what's going to wind up happening is, is that you're going to be losing a lot of the um, heat that was in the solution that you started with. So you'll have to take that and basically work it back up again so that you can build the heat back up for your process. Um, the last one that you have there 
is the one from Oberlin. Now, Oberlin is a, a very, very efficient filtration system. Uh, for those of you who have seen it, um, their claim to fame has been for the zinc phosphate solutions. Um, they do a lot with the um, metalworking fluids also. And their solution is a little different than the other two. What they've done is taken the information that um, you get from an indexing gravity bed, and instead of having a gravity flow through the solution, what they're doing is physically forcing it through the fabric media, and then a platen comes down, covers the system, and they air dry it. So you wind up getting a cake that comes out, a dried cake that you're able to then dispose of much more efficiently. Um, the Oberlin system is very costly, uh, but it does do an excellent job. Part of the issues with the Oberlin, though, are that this particular system, the piping that goes to it, especially if you're working off of a zinc phosphate process, um, the piping can blind and plug up. And I'm sure you've seen what it does when the zinc phosphate solidifies inside some piping, uh, it becomes like concrete. So one of the things that's most important if you're looking at this type of system is that any elbow in your process becomes a T and any T becomes a cross. And because what you're trying to do is have an area that you can rot out or clean out that piping. Uh, because if it's coming to that and it dries down um, over a weekend, it could be a nightmare to try to get that process running again. Another system that's not pictured here um, that you may or may not have used is also a filter press. And we have a system that's out in the marketplace It's called an iron limitation unit. It's used a lot on the zinc phosphate applications in the wire industry. And what it is, it's a continuous feed system where you'd have a pump off of your zinc phosphate tank, pump it into a lamella style clarifier that has a mixer that diffuses air out of the atmosphere into the solution. The air that's in the atmosphere reacts with the iron that's in the zinc phosphate and allows it to precipitate out on the lamella plates. What's nice about that, the metal, the uh, fluff or the sludge that precipitates down goes to a clean out, which then goes to a filter press. And then the filter press can take the um, solution and press it similar to what the Oberlin does. I'm sorry I didn't have that picture in um, for this today, uh, but if anybody would like any information on that, that is something that I do have available um, if, in fact, you uh, find it necessary. The next area we want to just cover a little bit, and that is on powder feeding. Uh, when I first started with the company um, a few years ago, uh, the first project that I was assigned to do was to fix the powder feeding system that we had. And by a few years ago, I'm saying it was approximately 40 years ago, uh, when we tried to fix a powder feeder um, that was around. And this powder feeder, if you can picture it, was a drum had a special lid with a screen on it, turned upside down onto a small tank with a spray nozzle. And you had a pump that would spray up as it needed solution. It would spray up into this tank, and then the tank would gravity feed this powdered solution that was slightly diluted into a pump. Then the pump would transfer it to different feed lines. Um, the process was cleaning small containers for uh, the different soda bottlers, if you remember those old five-gal containers. Well, one of the problem with that was is that the lid would plug up, the screen would plug up, um, the powder inside the drum would solidify and become rock hard like concrete, and it became very, very difficult to control. So we, we looked at this and we said, well, this is n probably not the ideal way to do that. The ideal way we found may be to dissolve the whole drum at once and spray up into it and dissolve the whole drum, thinking that that would resolve everything. But at the same time, even trying to do something that simple by spraying up so much into it and the powder coming into the tank, the powder fell to the bottom of that container and solidified in the bottom of that container. So 
powder feeding has been something that we in the chemical industry have been working on for many, many years. Uh, it's not something that anybody has a, um, a, a, a finite approach to yet uh, because most of the powders that we have have hygroscopic tendencies. I mean, if you went into your kitchen um, store cabinet now and opened up and looked at your garlic powder uh, or your, your salt, uh, you may find out that it picked up some moisture and it's solidified in that container. And now you have to find a way to crush that up in order to allow it to flow back through the holes that you have. Well, the same thing that happens to us in the chemical industry is that we're trying to get that powder to feed in a uniform basis and it plugs up inside the hoppers. Um, literally, it will um, turn into a block of concrete and it'll trip out the overloads of the motors. It'll burn out the motors. And in some cases, it'll actually, the augers themselves will snap in half, which is what something has happened to us several times. Um, the one with the drum on top is a system that we had tried and it did work successfully um, during the um, you know, winter months when it was very cold and dry. Uh, but as soon as it became slightly damp in the environment of the facility, um, the powder tended to um, solidify and we had nothing but problems with it and uh, very, was very, very costly. So there's not a lot of great ways um, to, to feed powder under every circumstance, but there is a great association that you may or may not have heard of. It's the Powder and Bulk Solids Association. And if you're looking for uh, some ideas, um, they are a great avenue to look at. Um, they do make several different types of systems. There's one system that has been tested recently. It's very similar to your shop vac, where you're gonna suck, you suck the powder out with the vacuum and then place it into a, uh, in an area that you'd want to use it at. Uh, but they have a great association. Um, and if, in fact, you're looking for an idea to try to feed a difficult powder, um, they would be somebody that I would talk to. Again, these two being very common ones that you'll see out there, um, the auger style. Um, but at the same time, um, there's something new happening all the time. So I would ask you if you, you have the opportunity um, and you have a difficult application uh, to please, um, you know, give them a holler too. Bob, I think that's a great uh, suggestion. Could you repeat that name again of that association? All right. It's the Powder and Bulk Solids Association. Great. Because I know on the plants I go into, we always see operators opening bags and dumping the powders in or shoveling out of drums. And it's one of the things that's, isn't safe. I mean, it would be nicer if we could have something automated, but sometimes the maintenance problems outweigh the safety. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's fine. And also, some places, especially uh, for the activators, as an example, for the zinc phosphate, there's a lot of people that will take and, um, you know, use a slurry tank for the activation. Uh, again, it requires handling, uh, and the operator has to put in three, four, five scoops of the activation in in order to have it fed in. Um, these do help you out where you can feed it in and keep it agitated and use it so you only have to make those additions, you know, once or twice a week. Um, but at the same time, it still has the handling um, that we've tried for so long to try to get, you know, a control over. But again, you know, it's just we just haven't hit it yet. Next area we'd like to talk a little bit about, and that's in the process control area. Um, and you've probably heard Industry 4.0 spoken about a lot. Um, and there's a lot of truth to what they want to do with Industry 4.0. And specifically, you know, we know we can monitor a process, and we know we can monitor several value, variables of that process. But what we're trying to do or what they're asking for with the Industry 4.0 is to find a way that we can take those variables that we have the information from, and then we could make the different changes to the process to accommodate the changes in the different variables. So if the temperature goes up, if the concentration goes down, these kind of pressure goes down, these kind of things can be monitored automatically and adjustments made automatically so that 
it you don't have to have someone there watching it or doing it all the time so that's what industry 4.0 is driving right now and in our industry with the wire association there's a lot of different variables that we can monitor for our systems um, i'll go over a few of them and you can read the rest but if we take a look at your cleaners uh, typically most uh, companies will monitor the conductivity of the cleaner baths they'll look at the temperature uh, they may look at the time how long was the spool into um, the particular cleaner so we know was it able to get you know the true cleaning how many spools went in in a given day so we can get an idea on how much and then was in fact the is it about time to to change out the bath based on how much was processed you know do we want to monitor the chemical feed to know how much went in how much chemical we used on any given day if we're looking to do a, a filter on it you know can we monitor the delta p of the filter so that we can automatically tell hey we need to change this out or hey the media is shot or the pump is not pumping the way it should along with that the agitation pressure um, one of the things that's it's it's uh, sad in a way is that um, a lot of people rely so highly on gauges when they're talking about their agitation or monitoring their tank pressures and what happens with that is that the gauges sometimes do fail and when they fail they may lock up at that 10 12 18 psi whatever we're running at and not having a way to verify those gauges um, we had a pump that was running everybody thought everything was fine only to find out that there was no pressure at all coming out of everything um, they were blaming everybody and anybody for the failures what happened was is the veins on top of the pump head had worn down and because they worn down the way they did they were no longer getting the kind of pressure that they needed the gauge showed that everything was okay but realistically it wasn't had they had a transducer um, on it a transmitter that you can find out what the pressure was also they might have been able to pick that up along with that also the tank level maintaining the level at a certain amount and you may wonder why is this so important well the importance comes is because if someone makes a large add of water um, what will happen is is that your chemical balance is going to change until the chemical feed pump can bring it back to what is the normal range so if you can maintain your level within a certain delta as compared to looking oh i'm about six inches low let me fill it back up by doing that what you'll be able to do is maintain a tight delta your chemical feed will be minimal at any given time and you'll have a uniform bath all the time so if we look at the different parameters uh, for a rinse again typically what rinses we would monitor the conductivity maybe the temperature uh, again maybe the time how long it was rinsed but also the um, the filter and the agitation and the tank level the only ones you see that might be a little bit different uh, your activation and your zinc uh, your activation a lot of times will monitor both conductivity and ph uh, for your zincs we don't tend to monitor conductivity as much uh, but we do monitor ph because that is something that is uh, very important to know what the ph range we're in so this gives you a little bit of an idea on what typically we may do uh, with monitoring of the chemical processes now what's the best for you you know we have a survey that we do when we come out and we'll take a look at your process and we'll talk with you and go over what do you need what is important to you to monitor with a given stage on a given outlook of you take a look at the process that we described in the second slide today um, you'll you'll notice that the using that bath as and that tank layout as what we developed this for you'll see that there's approximately 87 analog digital inputs that we would monitor in order to get a very good idea of that process and we have approximately 16 digital um, outputs that we would use to take care of making necessary replenishments or corrections so we don't have to use everything that we had in that prior slide the prior slide was just showing you what could be monitored uh, then we can take a look at each individual stage and say what do we want to monitor 
what is important to us to know. And maybe, you know, the temperature of the rinse tanks is not important, so we don't need to include that. Same with the agitation pressure. Maybe we're not as worried about there, but we are worried about it in the chemical processes. Uh, maybe in the spray rinses, we want to know how much water we're using. So maybe uh, we'll take a look at what the flow rate is in a spray rinse. Um, the tank levels, again, like we talked about, um, maybe in our dryer, we want to monitor the temperature. We might want to monitor how much time um, something was in the dryer for. So these kind of things are things that we would typically look at and we would say, all right, what do we need to do now? Based on what we just went through and what we selected, what is the next step? And what we would do, and most chemical companies will do with you, is to sit down and then decide what type of instrumentation would be the best for you. What is best for your process? Um, and we're looking at what kind of pressure transmitters, what kind of level controls, uh, what kind of connectivity or pH monitors. And then do we want to also maybe monitor some of the energy constituents that we have? Do we want to take a look at, hey, how much gas did we use today? We put a meter on the gas line. How many, how much parts or how many total coils did we process today? Or how much water did we use today? Or even how much chemical did we use? If we can get that information and bring it in all into one area, what you'll be able to then do is view it from some type of SCADA system um, that you'll be able to see everything that's going on. Uh, again, the Supervisor of Control and Data Acquisition is this, you know, acronym that SCADA stands for. Um, we have our own, we have our Kodak system. There's a lot of different systems out there. And typically what we're trying to do is combine everything that you want to monitor, find the best possible um, devices that are out there for this so that we can take this information and really use it to give you the type of data that you need. Um, if you take a look, you'll see there's a lot of different things on here. And it's just a matter of taking those different things and saying, yes, this is what I would like to do. Based on that, then we want a screen. We want some kind of display that's going to show us exactly what's going on. This particular one would be for, um, you know, a spray rinse system. Uh, you can have the exact same type of design that would be for your agitation system. And literally what we would have, instead of having the, the nozzles that you see up top here, these nozzles would be placed inside your tank. The nozzles would change color if, in fact, the spray is spraying at the pressure you want. Um, each of the boxes here, you know, would show you exactly what's going on with your process, as well as your length of service of your pump. How many minutes or how many hours has that pump been operating? So you can get an idea not only how your solution strength is, not only how well your process is running, but also, hey, how that pump's been running now for, you know, 2,000 hours. Uh, we may need to, to take a look or get a replacement ready. We may want to take a look at the bearings to make sure they're okay. All this type of information could be combined and brought into one central area for you so that you're able to have all of that data and have that data in front of you. Um, you'll notice that the, the pump is turned green in this picture. And what that means is that maybe chemical feed has taken place. If in fact the valve was green, it may be blowing down or allowing some of the um, chemistry in that tank to going down because the solids are up too high. So these are the kind of things that you would wanna look for when you're looking at process control for your system. Um, this is one way of doing it. Um, there's also another way, and this is the way that's used a lot in the nuclear power industry. Um, the nuclear power industry, you know, the, yes, the, the screens with all the fancy pictures are very nice, but typically what they look for is they look for something to make it very simple and easy to read. So in this particular case here, you can see that if it's green, it's okay. If it's yellow, it means it's slightly above or slightly below what is considered to be your ideal setting. If it's in a red, it's in an area that could be a problem for you and it needs to be addressed right away. These type of process screens give you a, a great overview. They really make the process visible. So now you have something that you can take a look at 
and see exactly the way your process is running and then take this information and if the screen is done correctly you can double click on any one of these settings any one of these boxes and it will show you exactly what your settings are it'll show you exactly what your concentration is set for um, what your set point is what your high alarm or low alarm so you'll be able to see exactly how the process has been running for the past couple, you know, um, you know what your set points are for the past couple days. Uh, knowing this and having this information available goes a long way in making sure that your process is under control. So now we have all of this information. All right, what do we do with it? All right, what do we do with all of this data? Well, ideally, what we need to do is we need to set up a system, put something in place that's going to be able to collect this data, all of it, not just the real time, but be able to take it and archive it and do it in such a way that it's going to make it visible for everybody that needs to see it in your facility. So ideally what we'd want to do is take this information and put it into some type of system, some type of web-based system, so that you'd be able to, from any operator screen, anywhere in the facility that needs to see it, would be able to see exactly how the process is running. Now, some of the benefits of this, sure, to have a screen for the operator to see how everything is running right in front of him is always a big benefit. Having something possibly in the lab where you, know, you do all your controls so they can see and say, wow, I need to take a look at that. There's a problem there. Possibly in the supervisor's office. But another area that's sometimes overlooked is over in waste treatment. And uh, what happens is, is that if you're monitoring tank levels and a tank level is high, we know that it's overflowing. So waste treatment will know that he has water coming his way. If you're looking to maintain your rinse tanks and your rinse tanks have to be overflowed in order to get the TDS down and there's no more room left in waste treatment in order to have that um, effluent go to them, you know, something has got to stop. Something has got to be able to uh, say, hey, I can't take that right now. And being able to have a system that you can view in real time uh, what's going on, and then also you'd be able to archive it in such a way that you can see it is very, very important. And again, these SCADA systems, there's a lot of them out there, um, and they're good programs, and they've been around for a long time. The most important thing is, is being able to have one, though, that can give you the data and archive it and trend it. So you have something that you have your data collection, you have your data uh, any given day, you can see exactly how you ran. You can see when they started up in the morning, were they up the temperature when they started up, when that first coil went in, how did it run throughout the day? How did everything look throughout the day? And if in fact the situation occurred, you know, can it be fixed? Can something, somebody take care of it? Anytime you have any of these alarms, these alarms should be sent out. They could be emailed. They could be sent via text message. Somebody could be notified about any of these types of things so that you're able to easily, you know, address them right away when they occur. I mean, pipes break, pumps go down, valves hang up and overflow. But having someone be able to be notified, not only changing red to yellow on a screen, but also the ability to notify somebody about that so that it can be handled promptly is real, real important. And a good data collection system, a good system, a SCADA system will allow that to happen for you. So it's a matter of taking that data and using that data and having it so that you can take a look and say, all right, look, this is how I ran today. And I don't know what happened, um, you know, somewhere around four o'clock in the afternoon, we had a couple of hiccups there. And I don't know what happened a little after midnight that we went down so low. Uh, we need to take a look at that. We need to find out what's going on and we need to get that line so it's a little bit closer together for us. So these are the kind of things that is, you know, is important in the industry. This is the kind of things that we work with customers um, every day to try to help them out putting a system together um, in order to uh, help out their process. So whether it be going back to the original slide, whether it be, you know, in the agitation of the tanks, 
and monitoring the agitation, what can be done, whether it be extending the bath lights to filtration, um, whether it be seeing what we can do to help them because they really like this powder product that we had and they want to find a safe way to handle it, um, or whether it be the way of just controlling your process at any given time and, they, and taking the data. These are the things that a good chemical company will do for you. It's the things that we do and our competitors do uh, because we want to make it right. We want your process to be around for a long time. And uh, we're hoping that by working together, we can really help you out with that. So with that, I hope I, I covered the little bit of information that was enough to um, give you some ideas on, on what's available out there. And uh, at this time, Dane, um, you know, is there any questions that uh, we may want to go over? Yes, there is. There's been questions coming in throughout the presentation. Um, due to the time restrictions, I didn't want to interrupt every time one came in. Uh, a couple of them I can make a little bit of an answer for also. A number of questions came in about pH monitoring and why is it important for zinc phosphate and can you control a zinc phosphate bath by, control, you know, watching the pH? The answer is no. Uh, the pH is important in a zinc phosphate processing line when you're monitoring rinses, uh, neutralizers, those areas, because you want to make sure you don't get out of range on the rinses. Now, Bob, maybe you could talk a little bit about auto titrators because pH is one of the things that are used in auto titration for um, doing all the tests that you would normally do manually, uh, which would go into the SCADA system also and feed into that. Could you uh, just elaborate a little on auto titration and how it works? No, I'd be happy to. Um, and I'm sorry, I, the, the pH control for zinc phosphate is not necessarily for control, it's for monitoring. Uh, one of the things we don't want to do is have the pH escalate up and uh, what will happen sometimes if the rinses before it uh, are not kept in a clean mode. Um, we've had tendencies where the pH does escalate up and that becomes a problem for us. So it's just a matter of knowing the pH. But um, on the auto titrator, there's a couple of really good companies. One uh, company's name is Metra Ohm. Um, they're a, a company, they're based out of Florida and um, they make a very, very nice auto titration system. And what the auto titrators will do is it'll do the same titration that your workforce would normally do, um, whether it be a, um, an alkaline titration, uh, an acid titration. Um, they can do the different titrations, including the ones for some of the advanced pretreatments that you may have heard about. Um, they can do these titrations and do them remotely. So you'll have a line and a pump that would take the solution from your process tank, bring it over to the auto titrator. The auto titrator then will actually do the titration for you. And basically it sends a signal to a SCADA device so that it can make the necessary chemical replenishments based on the titration that was done. And then right after the chemical replenishment is done, it can be set where you can put in, all right, in 30 minutes, let the tank mix itself thoroughly, do another titration, see if it still needs the, um, any other chemical additions. Um, they're very, very good systems. They're extremely accurate. They're a little on the expensive side, but again, it's all relative. Um, you know, a good auto titration system that could do um, multiple parameters, you're probably somewhere in the eighty to $150,000 range um, in order to do that. But if you look at the titrations that we're doing now, if we're doing a titration, you know, twice a shift or once a shift or once an hour, these titration systems can do one every 10 minutes. Um, so when you're looking at you know, repurposing manpower, you may have people that right now are working the hoist, working everything, and then they're running down to do a titration once an hour. Well, now that person could focus on his job, and now the uh, auto titrator can make those titrations for you. Um, the only issues with the auto titrators that we have to be cognizant of, similar to what I mentioned about the zinc phosphate, the way the lines plug, that is the biggest problem and that's why you want to use a good company when you're looking at the auto titrators. You want a company that's going to design the delivery system also in such a way that it's not going to be plugged up. It's not going to become an issue for you and solidify 
where you have to take all the, the you know the piping out or tubing out and replenish it. So whenever you're looking at them, they're like I said, Metro Home is just one company. There's numerous others out there. The feed system that goes to the auto titrators is probably the most critical thing. Uh, the auto titrators themselves work very, very well. It's just the method of getting the solution to them that could become a problem. Another question on the same topic uh, is, is any automation for securing concentration, specifically when there are more than two elements or components in the bath changing conductivity and pH? And I think you uh, answered that. The auto titrators now can do any testing that the operator can do. It's just a matter of how complicated the process is for the auto titrator, correct? Yes, anything that you're titrating now for the bath, if you're titrating, you know, copper, if you're titrating iron, if you're titrating alkalinity or you're titrating zinc, you're, you know, anything that you can titrate for, an auto titrator can do that titration for you and make those necessary additions or replenishments of an individual ingredient, if in fact that's what you're titrating for, or for the uh, the process chemistry, if it's a um, a mixture of the different things in it, yes. Another question on uh, the powder feeding. We're going backwards here now. That's okay. Have you looked at Have you looked at uh, using a dry nitrogen atmosphere for the drum auger, which was on the right, which I think was your upside down drug sis drum system for putting in powders? No, we have not. Um, we have not taken a look at that. I will make a note of it. Um, it is it is something that possibly could work, um, but again, it's adding something else to a a customer, um, you know, that they may or may not have or may not be able to have at their facility. Uh, but I will look into that a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, which filtration equipment should be used for phosphate solution removal of sludge? Well, if we're looking at the the zinc phosphate um, solution. Probably the best one, you know, on the market right now is the one from Oberlin. Um, again, it is the most expensive one, um, but their claim to fame and what they've done um, for zinc phosphate solutions, that's probably one of the best. Um, there's another method that I didn't mention, but I, I get it's used quite a bit, and that is using a clarifier. Um, some people, what they will do uh, with some customers is they'll have a, a clarifier tank, they'll bump the solution up overnight. And uh, some customers even have two clarifier tanks. So <clears throat> what they will do is just pump one solution up, let it settle for a day, and then they have a solution that they're using in tank that, that, that day while it's settling, and they keep changing it out. Uh, they may have a filter press or even sludge bags I've seen um, where they just pump it. They open the valve at the bottom of the clarifier to get the, the sludge out and allow the clear liquid to come back to the tank for processing. Um, that works. Uh, it is an inexpensive way to go. You do need to have the, the footprint in order to have two tanks that can uh, you know, accommodate the solution from your, your zinc phosphate. But that is also a, a very economical way of doing it. Um, it's just not as automated, I guess, as some people would like. Next question is, uh, I think this is for bag filtration. Is 25 micron size filtration a good starting point, or where would you recommend? No, 25 is a very good starting point. And if you, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's several companies out there, um, Paul, uh, Sir Filco, people like that. And, you know, if you'd speak to their engineers, 25 is probably a good starting point for a lot of the uh, applications that you have. So whether it be a cleaner, uh, whether it be a pickle tank, and also with your rinses, um, if you wanted to start at 25, and if you say, wow, he says, you know, it's blinded up weekly uh, on me, well, maybe you can go down a little bit less and even keep the tank even cleaner. Um, if it's blinded up within, you know, a couple minutes, uh, now you have an option. Do you take the tank and try to get it all cleaned up first once and then see how often the bag will plug? Uh, or um, do you just upsize it a little bit and see if you can get, um, go with a 40 micron or a 50 micron and work your way down? The other option you have, and again, we don't use it a lot in, the, uh, in our industry, but the cartridges, if in fact you wanted to go with cartridge filtration, 
Uh, one of the things about cartridge filtrations is as they blind um, and they, the, the media itself tends to blind, they filter out finer and finer particulate. Uh, so with some people, what they'll do with a cartridge filtration, you may start out with 100 micron cartridges inside your, um, your vessel. And as the 100 micron vessel, as it takes out the 100 micron particles or bigger, these, now the space that it can flow through becomes smaller and smaller so that it'll constantly filter it finer and finer and finer until the cartridge is ultimately plugged and it, it can't be used anymore. So sometimes you may see some information telling you that if you go with a cartridge filtration, uh, you may be able to start out with 100. And I've seen that. And what will happen is, is that as the cartridge becomes, you know, um, bind up, um, it allows finer and finer filtration to take place and it actually gets your tank cleaner and cleaner. So that is another option. Okay, early on, uh, it's what type of cleaner is used for, what type of chemical is used for cleaning? Normally in a phosphate line, you use an alkaline cleaner. You have to match it up with the soil if you're going to be removing what you're going to be moving oil before it goes into the line if it's going to be removing polymer um, for re, re clean so the, the cleaner has to be matched up to the soils you're looking at at the start of a uh, phosphate line would that be correct bob yes okay uh regarding the inductors is this suitable for acid baths also yes it is the inductors again they're made out of your the different materials of construction uh, dependent upon the acid. Um, you know, they have them in 316, they have them in Carpenter 20 alloy, uh, but a lot of people will also use the, uh, the Polypro or Kynar ones uh, for the acid tanks. It's just a matter of protecting them. Uh, so if you're gonna be putting them into place, just some type of protection, and it could be nothing more than some angle brackets that if in fact the spool should ever fall in for whatever reason all the way down and hit against them, the angle brackets would stop it from hitting onto the adductor itself. Okay, this will, let's see, there's one question here. Let's see. This might be difficult. What type of nozzle selection would you require to perform cleaning in five to 11 millimeter wire rod? I think that would take some laboratory work, wouldn't it? We would want to calculate that a little bit better. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, another question: What is red copper peppering be in the uh, chemical bath? That would that would be more chemical and outside your realm, I believe. Yeah, you can handle that one. Yeah, that, that's one. If you send it, uh, we'll try to get you an answer. I'll have to get that from one of the chemists at uh, BASF, maybe. Uh, probably here's the last question, and this is going to be a good one. Is the system of analyzing the data and deciding uh, the dosage and chemical additions self-correct the uh, parameters? Um, something like a level two automation. I'm not sure what level can two you, automation is. Can you repeat that? And I'm sorry, I did the yeah. first part of the question. Is the system of self-analyze the data, does the system self-analyze the data and decide and do the chemical additions self-correcting the parameters? So I guess we're asking about the level two automation of the system. If it goes in, will it automatically make the correct dosages to the chemical baths to bring them back in range? Yes, it will. And that is the, the whole purpose of looking at these, you know, the this type of system in that you want something that's going to be able to automatically correct it for you. Um, there's several ways to, um, to do this. If you're looking at an auto titrator, like I explained, they would do the titration, they'll do the testing and analysis. Um, they'll say, okay, look, based on that, I am um, two points low. And that two points low may mean I need to feed in um, five gallons of product. And again, you'd have that calculation already set up inside the auto titration system. Um, then we would send the signal to the pump to feed in that five gallons of product with a flow meter, um, find that it's okay when it's done, give the tank exactly, you know, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, a half hour to recirculate. Uh, and then we would test it again to find out where we're at. So yes, the whole idea behind this is to try to have it so that everything can automatically 
um, make the changes and make the additions, uh, or in the case of a, a rinse tank, make the subtraction to get rid of the high TDS um, rinse water and allow fresh water to come in. Um, so yeah, that is what we we try to do with these systems. Well, it appears we're out of time, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and Bob, especially you, for the very informative and uh, exciting and interesting presentation. So with that, I want to thank all the attendees and look forward to hearing from you on other topics you would like for webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you all.